<laughs> Good afternoon. Welcome to my talk about the UEFI subsystem in U-Boot. My name is Heinrich Schucher. Oops. My name is Heinrich Schuchert, and I'm working in my paid life as a software consultant in the ERP and in the supply chain area. But um, I've been contributing to U-Boot since uh, 2017, and I've been since the beginning of last year the maintainer of the UEFI subsystem in U-Boot. And now you may wonder why I got there, and this is what I will start my talk with, and then I want to dive with you into the internals of UEFI so that you understand how UEFI really helped me to solve my problems in booting uh, from the network. So let's get it. So why do I want to boot from network? So I had a few little boards of the Raspberry size, not Raspberry itself, and the fastest connector on these boards was really the Ethernet port. They didn't have SATA, they didn't have PCIe, and of course you could plug in a USB 2 um, converter uh, to a SATA drive, but a SATA drive still cost me more than the board itself, and so I thought network booting would be the natural choice to uh, carry on. And um, network booting exists in U-Boot, so you can set up a boot P or DHCP server that will provide the address um, of a script, then the script can be downloaded via TFTP, and then you can boot from an NFS server. But unfortunately, as U-Boot only supports UDP, this server has to be set up that is running via UDP. There's no authentication at all, and I thought, oh gosh, that's not what I want. And then I uh, knew, of course, what we were using in our company, and typically in a server environment, you are running iSCSI, or, or you're running uh, using fiber channel or whatever. So iSCSI is not like a Zamba serving singular files, but it's really providing a block device. So it's like just a virtual hard disk that you have where you can put your own partition table on and then create your partitions, and then you will have your boot partition and your home partition and your root partition. And it offers really authentication. So the server and the client can mutually authenticate each other. It's uh, the chat protocol that's being used, so it, there's some common secrets those uh, two parties have. It's, it's use some challenge, so that's it's not, it always the same uh, being transferred, so yes, you cannot have replay attacks. And if you need more security, you could separate, of course, um, your storage uh, array network from the rest of the network by a VLAN or use IPsec for encryption. So this is what I wanted to do with my board, which was running U-Boot. And U-Boot is one of the most common firmwares for those little boards for booting. So as looked at the specification, started implementing a bit in iSCSI, and saw it's tedious, and hasn't anybody done it before? Why should I do it myself? And that's when I came upon a software called Apixi, where the main developer is Michael Brown, and uh, it's just like a Swiss army knife. It has implements lots of different protocols. The origin of it was it was just a replacement ROM for your network card for doing Pixie booting. But now it can support booting from HTTPS server, from iSCSI, that's what I'm interested in, uh, can boot via fiber uh, channel um, over Ethernet or ATA over Ethernet. It has its own scripting language, and it can be built as a new AFI payload. And that's when I thought, OK, on my workstation at home, I'm use, having UEFI booting my X. It is. Uh, Six computer, so does this also exist for U-Boot? Yeah, and in 2016, Alexander Graf, at that time working for SUSE, now it's at Amazon, he was really starting to implement uh, the UEFI standard inside uh, U-Boot. So the driving side for his company, SUSE at that time, was that they wanted to boot 
all devices the same way. They said, if we would a server by grub and then grub loads a Linux kernel, we want to do the same on a Raspberry 2. And that was why SUSE was interested in getting UEFI into U-Boot, which was running on those small boards. And I said, oh, that looks, it's complete. So I have a Pixie, I have, can compile it as a UEFI uh, binary, run it with U-Boot, and great. That's what happened. <laughs> I just got a return code, uh, a bit cryptic, but if you convert it to a hexadecimal and look it up, okay, you see it's error code nine out of resources because there was only one event possible. That was really the reason. I said, okay, maybe now that everything is there, let's try compiling a hello world. Just writing hello world on the console and then do a return statement. And it crashed again <laughs> because... Um, Alexander assumed that every uh, executable would exit via the exit API call. And that's when I really thought, okay, that seems to be really something that has been started but needs some support. And that's when I got into this. So in, uh, I started uh, sending in the first patches uh, mid of 2017 when there was really, it could barely boot grub, and with grub you could really boot into Linux. That was working, but nothing else. And in 2018, uh, with the May uh, edition of U-Boot, I could finally really run IPixy and boot from my iSCSI server. And of course, the voyage was not finished there, so it was still not really conformant with all the details of the UEFI spec. And finally, last year, we got it to a point that we could run the UEFI shell. That is a shell like the DOS shell, really primitive. But you can run different binaries. You can set variables. You can uh, have a small editor even in there. And um, this is the basis that you need to run the self-certification uh, test that uh, Life and Art had been talking about. And... So I have written about 60% of uh, the AV code, but there were in total 40 contributors contributing uh, to this um, to get it running. And uh, now you are, may ask yourself, where is really UEFI sitting? Because when some people talk about UEFI in the x86 world, they're just talking about if it, as if it were the whole bias, if the whole firmware is UEFI. No, UEFI is simply a standard. It's defining an API. The question is, where is it used? So what I've put here on the board is just the boot process with ARM um, trusted firmware as it's running on 64-bit ARM um, uh, CPUs. So where does it start, really? Uh, the, the CPU has a little ROM with which it loads the first part of the ARM um, trusted firmware, which then boots the VL2 trusted boot firmware, which then runs to the next part, loading BL31, which is the uh, uh, exception level three uh, runtime. In this runtime, you find uh, things like uh, the power state coordination interface, which is responsible for resetting a board. So they provide already an API, which then can be called by U-Boot for resetting a board. It can, but it not always does, also boot uh, in the secure world an extra operating system, um, where you can run, for instance, uh, OPT. This will come in handy if you really want to have secure boot because we could use it for storing variables. That is something that Leon Linao is currently thinking about. And um, yes, of course, the BL31 also loads BL33, which in our case is U-boot. But there are, of course, other implementations like Tiano Call, uh, EDK2, like we heard in the last call. And now U-Boot or EDK2, they are offering this API, which is defined in the UEFI spec on 2,500 pages. And now this spec uh, defines uh, different API calls we will look into. And these can be used by, by Grub or by IPixi to communicate with U-Boot or EDK2. And they can also be used in the Linux stub for the same sort of communication. So when we now start a UEFI binary, 
what is the first thing uh, that it sees? It simply gets a pointer. It gets a pointer to the system table, and the system table contains different services that are available. And by these services, it can also discover some protocols which offer additional APIs. And we have two major parts in there in the system table. The one thing is boot services. This is what is available until the, really the operating system is running. And when it's running, only the runtime services are left over. For instance, uh, those services that are necessary for rebooting or setting uh, boot variables. And there are also configuration pa tables passed. We heard Art that he said, OK, currently we are passing the device tree. Can't we get rid of passing the device tree in here as a configuration table? The servers use instead ACP, or And also we have an SMBIOS table passed. And if you look at the protocols, um, they are really providing things like network access. They are providing um, access to block devices. So if you now look into what are the atoms really of UAV, the two uh, object types, they are, they are one thing that is handles. This is just a pointer on which protocols are installed. And there are events that are triggered uh, by a timer and then called back into the binary. Um, or they can be triggered by a call of one of the services. If you think about what is the lifetime of such an object, of such a handle, it's created when the first protocol is installed, and it's deleted when the last protocol is removed. When we look into drivers, what will be coming interesting uh, in a second is a driver is simply a handle which has a specific protocol installed on it. So it's a piece of software that when it's installed, the handle is created, the AV driver binding protocol is installed in it. And here you see what really protocol means. A protocol is just a structure, a pointer to a structure. And it's a, a GUID which identifies this protocol. And um, in the protocol interface, for instance, of the AV driver binding protocol, you find there are three functions in it. Uh, support at start, stop, and there are three data fields, uh, which version the handle uh, of the image uh, that was loaded to get the driver running and the driver binding handle. And on the other side, of course, there are the devices, also in the specification, sometimes called controller. And that is a handle which has an AFI device pass protocol and um, which you could use just to get an overview of what devices really exist. I've just printed out what I had on my laptop, where you, for instance, see OK, there's a PCI root. On the PCI root, there's some um, uh, NVMe drive. And on the NVMe drive, there is a partition existing. And the same thing also for the, on the SATA side. These were examples just of such devices that exist there. And now how um, are drivers and devices attached to each other? The, in the boot services, there's a call called Connect Controller. And this one f calls uh, the supported function of the um, protocol, um, finds out uh, whether there's a match. Then um, the start method is called um, of the uh, by, uh, driver binding protocol. And then the driver is really started, and it installs its own protocols on the controller. So for instance, if you have a hard drive and the hard drive asks, OK, uh, who can serve me, then maybe the controller will install um, a FAT file system on it. And it also may uh, create child controllers or extra handles it may break. And if you now look into how this put, is put into the picture with iPixie, on the right side, I simply have some parts of U-Boot. So in U-Boot, there is a network driver. On the, for the network driver inside U-Boot, there is a simple network protocol exposed. And there is also some driver existing uh, AFI block device, which exposes um, the driver binding protocol for block devices. And now when X iPixie is loaded and running, then iPixie installs a TCP IP driver. This is necessary because U-Boot only knows UDP. 
it installs an iSCSI driver and uses this iSCSI driver to connect to the server and uh, installs uh, on the drive that is connected to a block I.O. protocol and then calls connect controller. And this connect controller <coughs> then reaches out uh, to the block device driver and U-boot, which then uses the FAT driver that exists and, and the logic for identifying partitions to expose a simple file protocol. And this simple pro file protocol then can be used by Pixie to actually load GRUB or directly load Linux. And essentially, GRUB then will do just the same thing. GRUB will, when it tries to load something, it will call the simple file protocol, which in turn calls the FAT driver. The FAT driver calls the AV block driver, which knows, okay, I'm connected to that handle with the block IO protocol, which links back to the SCSI driver. The SCSI driver <coughs> by the TCP IP driver calls the simple network protocol driver and then loads the different um, blocks uh, of um, Linux and of the initial RAM image. This is how these all go together. I have here um, a short movie. Oops, if it will get it. So that's where it's actually um, starting to boot. So here I can't, uh, first of all, U-Boot tries to find its own devices like USB devices. It finds its um, SD card. And then a script is running, which simply loads iSCSI. Uh, known as IPXE, uh, oops, IP, uh, Pixie uh, loads GRUB, and then GRUB uh, just continues, as we know it, to load um, the Linux kernel. So, um, yeah, for me, the takeaway really was, yeah, by providing a common API, we really can run standard software on U-Boot, which before that we could only run maybe on a PC that has an UEFI BIOS or which uh, was running Piano Core or whatever. And now suddenly we can run things like Grub, like at Pixie. <coughs> so when we think about, okay, what was problematic in doing all this? The one thing really that was nasty about U-Boot is that it's running single-threaded. It has no network interrupts. And so, especially for implementing events in lots of different places, one really had to call back into some routines that would handle event queues and know, okay, who is waiting for an event and call those functions. So that was one part of the nastiness in it. Another thing is U-Boot is more than 10 years old, and of course, it comes with its own history. And the model how drivers are implemented in U-Boot is currently changing. It's trying uh, to get more modular. There's a new model based on device trees uh, installed inside U-Boot, but it's not used everywhere. And this really stops us from getting a very tight integration between the UEFI uh, code inside U-Boot with the drivers. It really sits more on top of it than being really well integrated. And that's something we will have to work on once we get the driver model really firmly established. Yeah, when we look into what are the development targets for um, UEFI inside U-Boot, it's not the idea to implement all those 2,500 pages and then come up with a binary which is several megabytes long. The target of U-Boot has always been, should boot on a very small board. And this is um, why we will only implement a subset of UEFI. There has been an effort um, led by ARM uh, to define a restricted subset, which is called the embedded base uh, boot requirement specification, which is available on GitHub, <coughs> which requires that you have, OK, the, all the boot service in place. You have the runtime service in place. And there's one chapter which defines some other required elements that you should have. And we really want to stay small. So I often get complaints. The UEFI part is already growing too much. Currently, it's at something like 
70 kilobytes in the firmware and uh, nobody will be happy if it gets much bigger. So what have we achieved last year? Um, now we have all those all boot servers in place. We have uh, had, as I said, we were able to run the UEFI shell, which allowed us to do self-conformity uh, tests. And with this conformity testing using the SCT, um, we were able to fix a lot of differences to the specification, especially um, conformance issue where we're not checking uh, incorrect variables being passed. And um, yeah, we can run the AFI shell on ARM on x86. Uh, we can run the SCT. And now let's finish off with what is work in progress. We have just um, merged a work by Christian Tio Caltea um, so that we can have a verified boot, which is based on fit images. There's um, Linaro with um, Takahiro Akashi working on UEFI Secure Boot. Um, what we already have merged is um, uh, support for hardware ran, um, the number generators. And um, so I'm confident we, that we are improving a bit by bit. Thanks a lot for your attention. And it's up to your questions. Yes, please. So, um, NiPixC binary is usually not that small. So, do you store that somewhere on the system itself, or do you load that over the FTP? No, I w um, the question was where is uh, IPixy located? I personally always load it from the AFI partition. So, I have an AFI partition uh, where I have this on and I have the device tree on. Essentially, I have the firmware, the device tree, and IPixy on my. SD card. Uh, so you have to have an SD card. Yes. And everything else, grub, the kernel, and the um, RAM uh, disk is then loaded via iSCSI. Yes, please? If you say you want to stay small, how do you decide which part of the Unity specification you want to probably implement or not? Yeah, it's essentially what is in the EVBR, what we want to have. So the question was, um, which parts will we implement? And that's, that's why I mentioned the EVBR. And we, we have implemented some extra things that were necessary to run the shell and to run uh, the conformity tests, because they require some protocols that are not in the EBBR. Yes, please. So if I understand this correctly, once you have the system table and some of those protocols that you need, you can now load unified drivers once you boot into this unified subsystem and use those drivers to in principle, you, uh, the question was, can we really run um, extra drivers? We have everything in place, but I have not seen any implementation really using this. So currently, for in U-Boot, there are drivers for all sorts of storage devices and for no network and for USB, and we, at least the network and the storage devices we are exposing via UEFI protocols without any extra driver having to be installed. But if you say there is some sort of special device which you want to expose, then you could load a driver that you have written yourself. Yes, this is, is in place. Yes, please. Is uh, parts of the, if you want to support more than the EBBR, for example, I don't know if it's enough to boot Windows, is it possible to also configure out parts of the UEFI back spec that you know don't need? Yeah, the question was uh, how configurable is the UEFI subsystem? There are parts, or the, if you look into the configuration of U-Boot, it's like configuring a Linux kernel. We are choosing just the same key config system, and p some parts are optional that you can leave out, or you can completely eliminate the UEFI subsystem if the board is really too small. So there are some boards that only have place for 300 kilobytes of uh, firmware, and there you cannot have uh, the UEFI subsystem. <coughs> but if you have uh, 600 or 700 kilobytes, it will well fit in.
Yeah, then thanks a lot for your attention.